I take our attention this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 4, be reading out the King James Version. And today's scripture text is taken from a historical account of uh, when the Israelites were defeated by the enemy. They were defeated by the Philistines, and uh, the Philistines, they were constantly battling against Israel, trying to destroy them. And in and this particular battle, they defeated the Israelites, and This time, though, when they defeated the Israelites, they captured the Ark of the Covenant. And we pick up with the story when a messenger ran out of that army, ran out of that battlefield, and he went to Eli, who was the high priest, and he had been serving 40 years as as the judge of Israel. And uh, Eli received that message, and that's where we pick up with the story, and that is the backdrop of the scriptural text this morning. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, that messenger, the man said unto Eli, he said, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, Eli, what is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before Philistines. And there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, they are dead, and the ark of God is taken. It's a tragedy when the presence of God is taken from our life. In verse number 18, and it came to pass when he had made mention of the ark of God, that he fell off of his seat backward by the side of the gate. And his neck brake, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. You see, it's one thing to hear about family passing away, but it's another thing to hear about the presence of God being taken away from the children of Israel. It wasn't when his sons had passed away, but it was when he discovered the Ark of the Covenant had been removed that he fell backwards and he died. In verse 19, and his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, she was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed for her pains that came upon her. In other words, the, the tragic news, the bad news, it sent her into early labor. And because of that, she travailed and she began to bring forth a son. And about the time, though, she brought forth her son and about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said to her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. It's a tragedy when God removes his presence from us. Could we just lift up our hands and ask God that his word would speak to us, that God would challenge us, and that God would impart his strength and his spirit into our life. Lift up your hands. Let's open up our heart to receive the word here today. Make it personal. Make it personal. Hallelujah. He said, the glory is departed from Israel. For the ark of God is taken. I feel to minister on this thought. My brother is good. My brother is good. Before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, don't talk about my brother. You can be seated. You can, you can talk about me. You can talk about somebody else, but don't talk about my family. Have you ever said that? Don't talk about my mother. How many can relate to that? Growing up, you didn't care if your friend talked about you, but just don't talk about my brother. Don't talk about my family. In other words, if if you talk about my brother, that's some fighting words. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to push back. 
Because my brother is good. Maybe you don't feel that way. I feel that way. My brother's good. But to Israel, the Ark of the Covenant, it represented the very presence of God. It represented the place where God dwelled. It represented God's presence. And the Lord was always with Israel, and the Lord is always with us because he is omnipresent. But we discover that when God was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and during their exodus, God was with them. But when they got into the wilderness, the Lord did something mighty and something powerful. He, he began to localize his presence uh, to a particular place. And he did that for the benefit of the people so that he could not only dwell with them, but he could dwell among them. And we see that in the tabernacle in the wilderness, the Lord gave Moses special instruction to design the tabernacle and he gave him those instructions and he began to design it and he began to build the tabernacle in the wilderness and Moses recorded the the desire of the Lord to always be with his people but also to dwell among them and we see that in Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 Moses recorded and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. In more than one place, we see that God always had that desire. But in a more specific way, the ark served as a very place that, that God would reveal himself. God would reveal his glory. His, his presence would dwell uh, uh, above the wings uh, of the cherubim. And, and he would reveal himself throughout all of Israel. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, we find Moses recorded this and this. There I will meet with them, and I will commune with them from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. In other words, he was saying, Moses, I want you to build me a tabernacle. I want you to build the ark of the covenant, and before the mercy seat, that's where I'm going to meet with the people. That's where I'm going to to reveal my glory. Here we discover, I believe, something that is mind-blowing, and it's the idea that God desires to be among his people. But more importantly, it's the fact that the eternal God, who is not constrained by a particular location, he's not constrained by the existence of time, he's not constrained by the existence of space, but God transcends all time, and he transcends all also space, uh, but the very one who fills all that time and fills all that space, he lowered himself, and he lowered himself to be among the weakness of his people and manifest his presence upon among the people of God. Well, what's amazing about that, he confined himself to one location, yet he was omnipresent. In other words, God Almighty, he chose to stoop very low and humble himself, humble himself to be among men. He humbled himself so that he could be with the people that were wandering in sin and wandering in the wilderness. Does that sound familiar to you? In the New Testament, we see God lowering himself to become something that he had never been before. In the New Testament, we see God lowering himself. He left position. He left his estate in heaven, and he made himself a servant. He made himself and manifest himself as flesh so that he could save all of mankind. I'm thankful that God not only lowered himself in the Old Testament, but God lowered himself in the New Testament. And we know that as Jesus Christ. You see, the prophets foretold about this. The prophets foretold about it. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he said, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. He said, behold, a virgin shall conceive and, and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. He continues on in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. And many of you could quote it. For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called. Father. 
Thank you for helping me preach. I'm thankful to know that his name is wonderful. I'm thankful to know his name is Counselor. I'm thankful to know he is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. And he is a Prince of Peace. But we also know his name as Jesus. Why don't you shout that name? Shout Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, my brother is good. In the New Testament, the angel spoke to Joseph who was the espoused to Mary the virgin. And when the angel spoke to Joseph, he confirmed what the prophets prophesied about in Isaiah and throughout the Old Testament. He confirmed what they said about the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ, the miraculous birth of the Messiah. And in Matthew chapter 1, we see that the angel came to Joseph, and he said, Joseph, Mary shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I'm thankful to know that when Jesus lowered himself in the New Testament, he made himself flesh and he manifest himself to all mankind so that he could take away the sin of the world. Jesus is the express image of an invisible God. There is only one God. There was one God in the Old Testament and there's one God in the New Testament. I'm thankful that he confined himself to one location. It's because he confined himself to one location that we could be forgiven of our sin. Oh, clap your hands under the Lord. Thank you, God. But unfortunately, without doubt... Sin and disobedience, it blinds us from this reality. It blinds us from seeing who Jesus really is. It, it blinds us from seeing the glory of God. And it begins to, begins to derail us in our walk with Him. You see, sin is very selfish. Our own selfish choices take us out of the presence of God. And it's because of sin that we're even separated from God. You see the sin in our, our life, it puts a barrier, a gulf between us and God. It hides His face from us. And it removes the glory of God from our presence. When we begin to sin, God is repelled because of darkness and light. They do not mix. They have no fellowship one with another. Yet it was never God's intention or desire to remove himself from the fellowship of mankind. Because again, from the beginning, we see that God always desired to be with man. In the garden, he walked with man. In the garden, he talked with man. And he wants to be beside us uh, every day but if we live in sin God begins to remove his glory and remove his presence and he hides his face from mankind it's a separation of that sin that exists because he is a holy God and we are sinful people in the garden of Gethsemane Adam and Eve they, they chose to disobey the word of God and because of their disobedience, it took them out of the presence of God. And consequently, sin entered into the world and it not only affected them, but it affected their offspring. And one of their offsprings, their firstborn born a son, was named Cain. And when Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, was born, they began to offer up sacrifices unto the Lord. And the first sacrifice Cain brought, and he brought of the ground. He, he was a tiller of the ground, and he brought of the first fruit of the ground. But we see that the Lord always required a blood sacrifice to take away sin and, and Abel his brother he brought a more acceptable sacrifice and God he accepted Abel's sacrifice but he rejected Cain's sacrifice because of that he was jealous he, he was envy and out of that rejection it caused bitterness and hatred and it caused Cain to begin to question his birthright question his inheritance and consequently out of that anger he murdered his brother 
Abel. He murdered his brother Abel, but Abel's blood cried out to the Lord. And out of that, we see a sarcastic question that Cain began to make to God. In Genesis chapter 4, when God said, where is your brother Abel? We see Cain respond with this sarcastic question. Am I my brother's keeper? Turn to somebody and say, am I my brother's keeper? You see, after Cain murdered his brother out of feelings of those jealousy and hatred, the Lord spoke to Cain, his brother, And he said, the voice of your brother and the blood crieth out from the ground. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. In verse 9, and the Lord said unto Cain, where is thy brother Abel? And he said, I know not. He said, am I my brother's a keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood, it crieth unto me from the ground. So what is exactly a keeper? If we were to look at that definition in the Hebrew, that definition would simply mean one that keeps guard. It was a responsibility to watch over your brother. It was a responsibility to protect your loved one. It was a responsibility to observe and to keep a safe guard over your brother or your family. It it was a responsibility to help your brother stay within safe bounds, to put limits that were safe in their life. In other words, it was responsibility to love and care for your brother as yourself. You see, this question, whether it was rhetorical and it was sarcastic, the Lord answered it from that time forward, even unto now. He began to answer it throughout all time. And the answer to that question is this. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. You need to love your brother. You need to love your sister. You need to look out for them. You need to pray for them. You need to protect them. You need to be with them. You need to guide them. You need to care for them. So yes, you are your brother's keeper. For the beloved disciple of Jesus, he picks up this theme and he reminds the church of its important in the New Testament. And he began to pin the letter in 1 John chapter 3 out of that inspiration. In John chapter 3, he said, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain loved, who was of that wicked one, and he slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteousness. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death, and whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. You can't go to heaven and have jealousy against your brother. You can't go to heaven being envious of your brother. You can't go to heaven being bitter against your brother. You can't go to heaven having unforgiveness in your heart. That's why today we need to get rid of all malice, all hatred, all envy, because if not, we do not have eternal life. Oh, hallelujah. How many thankful for your brother and sister in Christ? Could you just thank God for your brother and sister in Christ? My brother is good. My sister is good. Enemy, you can talk about me, but don't talk about my brother or don't talk about my sister. I'm going to stand up and defend them. I'm going to stand up and fight back. If they can't fight back, I'm going to push back. I am my brother's keeper. In other words, be your brother's keeper. That means that you're going to love them unconditionally. It means that you're going to be conscious that your actions, they don't just affect you, but your your affections affects the one that you're beside. 
Your actions affects the one that you're beside. Your sin will affect your family. It will cause them to be distracted and it can cause them even to stumble. That's why if your brother has a conviction that you don't have, you don't need to tempt them with that conviction. Let's say your brother doesn't want to go into a restaurant that has a bar. And I know some dear brothers that has that conviction. You don't need to invite them to Applebee's. You don't need to invite them to a place that has a bar. It may be okay for you to go, but you don't want to be a stumbling block to your brother. Oh, you might like bacon. I like bacon. I like bacon. But your brother may have a conviction not to eat it. So when they come over to your house, you don't need to make a ham. You don't need to cook bacon because it might be a stumbling block to your brother. Your actions affect your brother and sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are your brother's keeper. Being your brother's keeper means that you're going to be conscious of those things. It means that when you notice your brother is doing something wrong, when they're living a lifestyle of sin, hopefully you love them enough that you have a, a relationship with them that you can go to them and have a hard conversation, have a loving conversation and say, you know what, brother? I know you're going down the wrong path. I know you're beginning to get in some things that you know you shouldn't. I know you're watching some things that you shouldn't be watching and you're beginning to pick up some old habits. You're, you're beginning to pick up some old addictions. And, and brother, I love you, but you don't need to go down that road. I, I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to encourage you. I'm not here to condemn you, but I'm here to give you some strength. Uh, come to the house of God with me, and we can pray together. You see, being your brother's keeper, it means that you're going to notice uh, when they begin to wander away from the path of God. It means that you'll notice their needs, that you'll be close enough that you'll notice their needs, but also you'll pray for those needs, that you'll try to help them meet those needs. Being your brother keeper, it means that you're going to help them emotionally and spiritually, but uh, also financially, you're going to be ready to help those uh, that are in need. Uh, I'm thankful that South Flint, we're a benevolent church, and we have a benevolent offering and it's out of that offering that sometimes we help our brothers and sisters in Christ but we need to be ready to help our brothers and sisters that are in need if God has blessed you with abundance and you see someone struggling it's alright to say here here's a little bit of help I love you, I care for you oh hallelujah do you love your brother and sister? Being your brother's keeper means that you're going to sharpen one another. How do you sharpen one another? You talk about the things of God. You know, I'm so thankful for, for my heritage. I, I, I'm thankful the way I was raised. But I can remember times when families would get around the dinner table and they wouldn't just talk about sports and they wouldn't just talk about Hollywood. They wouldn't talk about politics. Uh, but they would take out the Bible and they would begin to talk about the Word of God. Church, we need to get back to the basics. We need to get off of Facebook. We need to stop watching Hollywood. And we need to open the Bible. And we need to say, thus saith the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Get back to the basics. Shake someone, say, we need to get back to the basics. Iron does sharpen iron. When we're around one another, we encourage one another. When we talk about the Word of God, the Word of God is indeed the sword of the Spirit. We begin to sharpen one another's focus. We begin to sharpen one another's focus and our mind and even our emotions. But, but spiritually, we, we regain that focus. When we're our brother's keeper, it means doing life together, even when it's not convenient. You see, if your brother, you are your brother's keeper, there's going to be times that you're inconvenienced. They're going to call and they're going to ask for help. We don't need to, we don't need to reject them, but if we have the means and if we have the ability and we didn't have the time, we need to help our brother and sister when they're in a time of crisis. Being your brother's keeper, it means that you're going to defend your brother against unfounded accusations and unfounded mal malice and even unfounded gossip. It means you're going to defend them. 
It doesn't mean that you're going to entertain that gossip and say, you know what? Uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, this happened a, a few weeks ago. I noticed this about that brother. I noticed this about the sister. You don't need to pick up that gossip and entertain it. You know what you need to say when someone begins to come and talk to you about gossip? My brother is good. Don't talk about my brother. My brother is good. Oh, hallelujah. I wish I had a few apostolic believers that believe that way. It felt way that way. My brother is good. Oh, hallelujah. Church, we need to love our brothers and sisters as ourselves. We are our brother's keeper. We must not neglect or forfeit that responsibility like Cain did. Because when we neglect that responsibility, it will cause us to be displaced from the presence of God. It caused Cain to become a fugitive and to live in sin and become a vagabond because of his unrepentance and his unwillingness to yield to the command and the word of God to love his brother. And because of that punishment, he was put out of the presence of God. But that not only affected Cain's life, it affected his mother and father, Adam and Eve, because he was put out of the presence of God and because he was a fugitive and a vagabond living in sin, the family had no brother's keeper. The family had no son. Adam and Eve had no offspring to carry on godly values. Adam and Eve had no son to carry on the truth to the next generation. Because of that sin, there was a sever of that brotherhood. There was a sever of the kinsman redeemer. But I'm thankful that God didn't leave them barren, but God gave them another son. We see that God will always respond to the need of his people. Why? He has always desired to be with his people and be their redeemer. They had no son. That means they had no kinsman redeemer. What is a kinsman redeemer? A kinsman redeemer was either a brother or a near kinsman with the responsibility or duty to restore and to recover the rights of the family. You see, the brother's keeper had the responsibility of avenging any wrongs uh, that happened to the family. He had the responsibility to restore that which was owed to the family. It was in the Mosaic Law. The kinsman redeemer had three primary responsibilities. Number one, to redeem and to recover the family property. The second responsibility was to liberate any of the family from the bondage of debt. The bond bondage of financial debt. Uh, and you may not be in financial debt here today, but there's another debt that every one of us uh, has to be delivered from, and that is the debt of sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I'm thankful that we had a brother. I'm thankful that we had a kinsman redeemer that liberated us from death. The third responsibility of the near kinsman was this, to marry a childless widow and carry on the family name. But with Cain sinning against God and choosing to be unrepentant, he lost that heritage. He lost that birthright. And consequently, Cain lost his identity as a child of God and as a son that would carry on the godly values of Adam and Eve. That's why God provided a brother's keeper for Adam and Eve. God gave the family a near kinsman. For in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. And to Seth to him also there was born a son and he called his name Enos and then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Notice uh, there was none of the family that was really calling on the name of the Lord until Seth was born. What is interesting about that? Seth means this, appointed 
or placed. And it's associated with the teachings of the Torah. In other words, Seth's birth, it was appointed and it was sent by God to heal the family of Adam and Eve. It was sent and it was appointed to heal their brokenhearted. It was sent and appointed to redeem and recover the family property. Seth was born and appointed to liberate them from the bondage of debt. Seth was born to carry on the family name and I'm thankful that another brother was born because it's out of the lineage of Seth that Jesus Christ was born oh I'm thankful that Seth was born because because of Seth Jesus was appointed somebody say my brother is good in Luke chapter 3 verse 38 we see that Seth is mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. You see, Jesus' birth, it was appointed and sent by God. It was appointed to heal man's brokenhearted. The birth of Jesus was appointed to free man from debt of sin. Jesus' birth was appointed to free us from the penalty of death. When Jesus stood up in the temple to read from Isaiah and announce his ministry, he declared in Luke chapter 4, For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty that them that are bruised. I'm thankful that Jesus' birth was appointed, and because of that, we can have a near kinsman redeemer. It means that Jesus is our brother's keeper. It means that he's our keeper, he's our redeemer, he's our protector, he's our advocate, he's our friend, he's our redeemer, and he is our brother. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth the life for his sheep. Notice it didn't say a shepherd, but he said, I am the good shepherd. As others may make a claim that they are a shepherd, they can't make the claim that they are the shepherd. Why? He is unique in all characteristics. He is unique in the fact that he's not only the father, but he is also the son. He's not just the son, but he's also the spirit. All these three are one, and they bear witness one unto another. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I'm thankful to know that he is our shepherd, and we shall not want. As a good shepherd, he's the one that keeps us. He's the one that guides us. He's the one that nurtures us. He's the one that protects us. For 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 says this, We know not that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. In other words, unless God allows it, the enemy cannot touch your life. If you are a born-again child of God, filled with the Spirit of God, the evil one cannot touch you. That automobile wreck that should have took you out, uh, the Lord had his hand on you and he protected you no weapon formed against us shall prosper oh i'm thankful that god protects us because he is your brother oh i wish somebody would testify if god ever kept you has god ever protected you Oh, I feel my friend up here. I feel my advocate. I feel my power and my strength. My brother is good. Don't talk about my brother. As our keeper, Jesus is also our advocate. First John chapter 2, verse number 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Why? Because when you sin, 
The glory of the Lord is departed from you. The presence of God is departed from you. He says, I don't want you to sin. And if any man sin, though, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, I'm thankful that when we fall and stumble, when we make a mistake, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father that is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Why? Because he is the propitiation. He is the satisfaction of our sin. He is the gift that averts the wrath of God for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, again, that propitiation, it just means he's the gift that averts the wrath of God. But as our advocate, an advocate is simply this. It's one that publicly supports and defends us against accusations of the evil one. Oh, hallelujah. So when the enemy stands up and said, he used to be a sinner, that individual used to be a whoremonger, that individual used to be a drug addict, that individual used to be an alcoholic, that individual has bitterness, that individual is a liar, that individual is a thief, that individual has hatred, that individual has unforgiveness. You have an advocate with the Father that's going to stand up publicly. And say, my brother is good. My brother is good. My brother is good. Oh, somebody should thank God that you have an advocate with the Father. Oh, I I think we should thank God you have an advocate with the Father. You have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that friend is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout, My brother is good. Oh, lift up your hands. Just thank God for a moment that you have an advocate, you have a brother's keeper. You have one that was appointed of God. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. He was sent to liberate you from debt. He was sent to protect you and provide for you and to keep you. And he is the good shepherd. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is our friend. He's our advocate. He is our brother. And he sticketh closer than that friend. You see, in John chapter 15, verse 15, you may be seated. In John 15, 15, we see this. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I'm thankful that God lets us know what he did. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So today we understand and we can know that because of his point at birth because Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, he's always desired to dwell among us, but because he dwelt among us and gave us his life, you and I can have eternal life and we can have the presence of God, not just around us and among us, but we can have the presence of God in us. And through that, he is our keeper. And he is our brother. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 10, we see the Hebrew writing, writer identifying that. He said, God for whom and through whom everything was made, who made all things, Jesus Christ made all things, uh, chose to bring many children to glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, uh, through his suffering, a perfect leader. How is Jesus a perfect leader? How is Jesus our keeper? He's a perfect leader. Why? Fit to bring them into salvation because of his suffering. You see, Solomon declared that we have a friend that loveth at all times. And he said, a brother is born for adversity. He is born for adversity. Going back to the battle between Israel and the Philistines, it's a good example of that adversity. It's an adversity that took the glory of God 
God away from the children of Israel. And the Hebrew writer identified that Jesus is indeed our brother. And when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, it was because they did not follow the command of the Lord in handling the Ark of the Covenant. And when we do anything that God doesn't allow, we begin to be disobedient to his word. We enter into a place of sin. We, we enter into a place of sin. It removes the glory of God from us. And that tragedy, it caused multiple deaths. We see the death of Eli, but we also see the death of Ichabod's mother. But in the process of that, the mother gave birth birth and named that son Ichabod. Ichabod was not a good name. Ichabod wasn't a good name to have. The name Ichabod means this, the glory is departed. Imagine having that name. Growing up as a child, they would call Ichabod, Ichabod, no glory. Come here. They would call Ichabod, they would call him over here, Glory has departed from Israel. Come over here. Every time an Israelite heard Ichabod, they would think of the defeat on the battlefield with the Philistines. Every time they heard Ichabod, no doubt they would hear and understand that the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. And because of that, there was 30,000 that were slaughtered. So Ichabod, it represented death. It represented failure. It represented disappointment. Uh, Every time they heard that name... I'm sure it brought up hurt. I'm sure it brought up pain. I'm sure it brought up a a terrible reminder of the past. Every time they heard Ichabod, you see the enemy of our soul, he wants us to remind us of our past. He wants to remind us of our failure. But I'm thankful that we have an advocate that will stand up publicly and say, my brother is good. My brother is good. My brother is good. Oh, put your hands together and thank God. You have an advocate with the Father. And that advocate is Jesus Christ. And he's thankful, the Bible says, to call us brothers and sisters. He can do that because he was made flesh. But I'm thankful also to know that The name Ichabod is not just mentioned one time in the Bible. But the name Ichabod is mentioned twice in the Bible. The first time we hear it is at his birth. And his mother said, I'm going to name him Ichabod because the glory of the Lord is departed. It means no glory. But the second time we see his name, it's very powerful. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse number 3, we see his name mentioned again. In Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas and the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. The first time we see Ichabod's name, it wasn't in relation to any other name. But this time we see it connected with his brother, whose name was Ahitub. What is fascinating about that name, Ahitub, it means this, my brother is good oh I don't know if that excites anybody but me but every time you have an accuser that says no glory you have a brother that's behind you and they would say a high tub my brother is good don't talk about my brother my brother is good oh I'm thankful that God provides a way of escape Oh, somebody should lift up your hands and thank God that you have an advocate that will say, my brother is good. Ah, when he calls you a drug addict, tell him I'm good. When he calls you a failure, say I'm good. When he calls you overdoser, say I'm good. Oh, would you stand to your feet? You see, we have a real enemy that wants to accuse us. For in Revelations chapter 12, verse number 10, John the Revelator seen this, that the musicians would come. He said this, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, And now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser 
of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before God day and night. You know what? You have an enemy. You have someone that wants to accuse you before God day and night. There's some, you you sinned this week. And you know what Satan is doing right now? He's saying, oh, look at so-and-so. This week, he looked at some pornography. Oh, this week, uh, they had some hatred in their heart. This week, they entertained gossip. You might not think it, but gossip is sin. You have an accuser that right now, day and night, is accusing you before the throne of God. You have an accuser that's saying, you know what? They, they drank some stuff they shouldn't have drank. They, they, they smoked some things they shouldn't have smoked. They said some things they shouldn't have said this week. And the enemy is reminding you of that. And every time he mentions it, you hear the name Ichabod, no glory, no glory, no glory. Look at your failure. Look at your defeat. Uh, look at the enemy. He's an overcomer in your life. But just as you have an accuser day and night, you also have a, a brother. And his name is Jesus. Uh, that is a mediator between you and God. And every time the accuser says, look at my brother, no glory, you have, a fa you have a brother that's saying, my brother is good. My brother is good. My brother is good. Oh, hallelujah. Would you just lift up your hands for a moment? The glory of God is getting ready to fall. The glory of God is getting ready to give somebody strength and encouragement. The glory of God is here. The glory of God has departed. Hear me. I pause here under the unction of the Holy Ghost. The glory of God has departed from some individuals' lives here today. And it's departed because there is sin in your life. But here today, you can be restored. You can have your mind and emotions restored. Spiritually, you can be restored. How are you restored unto God? How do you have the sin removed from your life? If you've repented of your sins, been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with His Spirit, all you have to do is repent. But if you've never done that, you first have to become a brother. Hear me, you first have to become a brother of Jesus in order for Him to be your advocate. For Him to be your keeper, He has to first be your brother. And the only way that he can be your brother spiritually is as if you are born again. Nicodemus said, how can I enter into eternal life? Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of spirit. He cannot enter into my kingdom. He cannot be my brother. He cannot be a part of the family of God. But I'm thankful we know how we can be a part of the family of God. On the day of Pentecost when Peter was preaching, the Jews stood up and notice what they said. When they began to heard that they had crucified the Christ and he was indeed both Lord and Christ, he was Lord and Messiah, they stood up and they began to be pricked in their heart and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said this unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, you can be Jesus' brother. And if he's your brother, he's going to stand before the throne and say, my brother is good. My sister is good. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Can we just pray a prayer of repentance in your own way? Can, can let's pray and let's ask God to cleanse our mind, cleanse our heart, cleanse us from sin and unrighteousness. Let's pray and ask God to cleanse us from filth. If you stumbled this week, just repent and God is faithful and just to forgive you. The moment you repent, God is saying, my brother is good. My sister is good. I don't hold it against them. When the woman, the act of adultery, when the woman was caught in the act of adultery, there was the religious leaders they gathered around her to stone her. They said, Jesus, the law says, stone her. What do you say? And Jesus knelt down in the ground and he began to write in the, write in the earth. And there's a lot of speculation about what he wrote. I believe he wrote their name in the earth. I believe he wrote their names in the earth. 
And there's scripture for that. Isaiah prophesied about that. All those names who are written in the earth shall be forsaken. I believe that when he knelt down, he began to write their names. And every time they seen their name, I believe they were reminded of their past just like Ichabod was reminded. And one by one, those accusers, they begin to go away because Jesus said, He that is without sin cast the first stone. And those religious leaders, there's not one of them that was without sin. And when Jesus looked up, he took the woman caught in the act of adultery. And he lifted her up. And he said, where are thine accusers? He said, neither do I accuse you, neither do I condemn thee. But he said, go and sin no more. In other words, he was saying, daughter, you're forgiven. Daughter, you are good. Go and sin no more. You see, when God converts us, He gives us the challenge to help liberate and free others. And notice this charge. And and this altar call is going to be unique because I'm going to ask you to take the hand of a brother. I'm going to ask you to take the hand of a sister. And I'm going to ask you to bring them down to this altar and pray with them. Because we are assigned to love one another, pray for one another, help one another be delivered from the grip of the enemy, the grip of depression. So I'm going to ask you to take a loved one by the hand, and I want everybody to come forward. Something unique, but the Lord gave Luke this charge, or or Peter this charge. In Luke chapter 2, and that's all right, you can go ahead and begin begin to come forward. Luke chapter 22, that's right. Take somebody by the hand. Bring them to the altar. Bring a brother. Brother to brother, take somebody's hand. Come on, take somebody's hand. Take a brother's hand. Come on. Everybody should be here in the altar. Come on, Holy Ghost, feel believer. The Holy Ghost is here. I need some prayer warriors just for praying the Holy Ghost for a moment. Come on. I'm going to give you some time to get down here. That's it, everybody, come down. Come on, this is your family. This is your family. Let's make way. Can we make our way closer to the altar? Just listen to Pastor for a second. Come on, can we make our way closer to the altar? Those that are here, make way in the aisle. Make way in the aisle. Make way in the aisle. That's right, come forward. That's it. Those that are in the altar, can you move a little closer? Move a little closer. We're just making room for those that are coming. That's it, thank you. Listen to Pastor, thank you. Please, move forward, move forward. We're just making way for everybody to get into the altar. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Does everyone have the hand of a brother or sister? There's still others that are coming. Let's still continue to pray and entertain. The the power of God is going to be poured out. His spirit is going to be poured out. If you need the Holy Ghost, you will receive the Holy Ghost. If you desire it, if you lift up your voice, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence speaking in other tongues. If you need healing in your body, healing is going to be released because you have an advocate with the Father. I'm going to read, listen. I'm going to read Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Because God gave Peter some instruction, and that is our instruction for this altar service. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. He called him by his former name. He called him by his past. He said, Behold, Simon, Satan had desired to have you. Satan has desired to have your brother. Satan has desired to have you, but he's desired to have your brother and your sister. Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. In other words, to destroy your life, to take the glory of God away from you. To perpetually call you Ichabod. Verse 32. But watch this. Your brother, your advocate said this. But I have prayed for thee. Oh. I'm thankful that you have a God and a brother that prays for you. That thy faith fail not. Now watch this. He said, Simon, I changed your name to Peter, but... But Satan desires to sift you as wheat. But I've already prayed for you that your faith fail not. And then he said this, but when thou art converted, 
When you're born again, when you're converted, then you're going to have the power. And this is what I want you to have the power to do. Strengthen thy brother. Church, uh, I want you to take the hand of your brother and sister. I want you to lift it high. And I want you to pray that God will strengthen them.